is the clock. Great. So this is a hundred mark question. Um, I think we'll try and cover like half of it. Uh, I don't want to. We're gonna cover half of it um, in today's session, and then we're gonna cover other half in the next session. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it says you are a third trainee accountant um, employed at a medium sized um, audit firm, namely ESA Incorporated. Most of the audit firms audit clients operate in the retail in the retail sector, and none of them are listed companies. Okay. So before I read the whole um, thing, I want to go find out what the required ones before I get into the actual reading. So required number one, um, it says with reference to background information, describe the substantive audit procedures that you would conduct to obtain audit evidence in respect of the occurrence assertion. So they're asking for occurrence assertion um, for additions and disposals of the mini trucks. And then they're asking for accuracy valuation and allocation assertion relating to the accumulated depreciation of the mini trucks. So it's very important to be as relevant as possible. If the question is asking for occurrence, you have to talk about occurrence. If the question is talking about accuracy, valuation, and allocation, don't talk about completeness or existence or, you know, so you have to be, it's not about how much you write, it's about how relevant you are. And then um, the second question says, um, with reference to the background information, and inventory describe the substantive audit procedures to test to test the rights and accuracy valuation and allocation of the inventory in transit. So this is very important information. They are not just asking inventory, but they want you to talk about the inventory which is in transit from the foreign supplier. Okay. Um, and then there's the third question. I just want to check how many questions this question has. So there's five questions. Let's see if we can do three questions today. Um, yeah, let's, let's, let's discuss the three questions today and then we will wrap up the question in the next session. So okay. Now we can go read. So we know we are looking for occurrence um, and then we're looking for uh, um, accuracy evaluation and, uh, and allocation. Okay, so let's go find out what the question is saying. Okay. So um, one thing, that I mentioned in the recording that I sent you is that your question will not explicitly say, hey, now we are dealing with the revenue cycle, or now we are dealing with payroll, or now we are dealing with the finance and investment cycle. Are you aware of that? Yes, I remember. Yes. So are you able to pick up which, which cycle the question is talking about no. by just reading the question? <laughs> some are clear some they're not yeah so okay so the first question wants us to talk about the mini trucks um in which in which um cycle do you think they belong to mini trucks mm -hmm. assets isn't it finance correct so it's an asset mm -hmm. if it's an asset then which cycle does it belong to Finance and revenue. Is it finance and revenue? Finance and investment cycle, right? Yes. Finance. Finance and revenue. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's very important for you to be able to know um, which cycle you're dealing with because the procedures in the revenue and receipt cycle are not the same procedures that you'll perform in the payroll cycle. So that's why the first thing you have to do is to ask yourself, okay, they are talking about trucks. Which cycle is this? They are talking about <laughs> The inventory cycle, um, it's quite like it's quite like inventory is quite self-explanatory. So when they say inventory, you must think, okay, inventory cycle. When they talk about salaries and wages, you must think, okay, my point of reference will be the payroll cycle. When they talk about a company which is selling something, um, then that would be the revenue and receipts cycle. And then the company which is buying something, um, that would be the purchases cycle. So you have to know which cycle. Um, they are talking about because the procedures are not the same. The substantive procedures are not the same. Okay. 
So now we okay. can question. Um, okay, so it says living well um, is in the business of selling natural and organic products from a warehouse in Tswane. Um, the company has been in business for the past decade and has been consistently profitable over the past financial years. So now that you have an understanding of risk of material misstatement at financial statement, do you think these people from the piece of information that you have right now, um, do you think that they have an incentive um, to manipulate the entire set of financial statements? For now, I, I cannot be sure because I, I have we not haven't read, read the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. But, my, but, but, I, but when you read your questions, like you must be able to think, okay, is there potential risk of material misstatement at, fi at financial statement level? Okay. So when they say mm -hmm. consistently profitable, yeah. so now we have to ask ourselves where they audited. Well, we want to verify that consistency. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue yeah. reading. So they say living wealth turnover for the 2021 financial year um, is reported as 5 million and budgeted the budgeted um, amount, the budgeted figure is 4.9 million. So they made slightly more than they had budgeted for. And then um, in 2020, it was um, 4.5 million, all right. So they say the gains in the current financial year are attributed to South Africans wanting to be healthier um, during the coronavirus pandemic and therefore buying organic health products. The company is not capital intensive and does not own the warehouse um, from where they operate. The company sources its products from, from both local and international wholesalers. So already you know that, okay, these people have inventory and these people get their inventory from um, local and international wholesalers. And therefore also has to comply with the various um, local and international laws and regulations and yes. so that all the laws and regulations are adhered to, Living Well has an exceptional team of legal advisors who advises them on the legal requirements and the changes there too um, on a regular basis, all right? Yes. In, in order to deliver products to some of Living Well's major customers, the company owns a fleet of mini trucks of which most of them are between two to three years old. So um, they own trucks. And by just reading this, I must, you know, you must think, okay, they have an asset. So um, when I talk about substantive procedures, they can't be substantive procedures relating to inventory because this is not inventory. It's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a truck. So they, yeah. And yeah. Is depreciation they are talking about the number of years that the, they've had these fleet the fleet of trucks so there's depreciation and there's the actual trucks and then some mini trucks were purchased in the current financial year and the account balance of mini trucks as part of the property plant and equipment balance is included at three million okay so this is the balance yeah. in the and the statement of financial position. So when you read your question, you must, you know, highlight, you know, just highlight the important information. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And then we're going to tell you that um, um okay, um 3.8 million um reported for 2020. The mini trucks are carried on the financial statements at cost less accumulated depreciation and impairment losses. So this is, an, also, this is also a very important piece of information because when you audit, you have to make sure that when they got to this balance of 3 million, they recorded it at cost, less accumulated depreciation and impairment losses, okay? And then depreciation mm -hmm. on mini trucks is charged on a straight line basis over their estimated useful lives, which is indicated as five years according to living wealth accounting policy so this is also a very uh, important piece of information because when you look at these people's accounting policy what if you look at the accounting policy and you realize that the accounting policy is written three years you know so you are looking for consistency mm -hmm. 
when you when you perform your audits, you want to make sure that okay, your use your your accounting policy is written five years, and when I do my recalculation of depreciation, um, it must be five years, okay. And then during the twenty twenty one financial year, it became very popular for customers to request that products are delivered to them, and therefore Living Well decided to include um delivery of products to the customer's premises as part of their customer service, all right? And then due to this decision, um, the frequency of trips that the fleet of mini trucks made to deliver products to customers increased um, substantially, which caused mini trucks to break down. So some of their trucks um, broke down because of being overused. And as these trucks might have to be replaced or undergo major maintenance in the next financial year, there is uncertainty whether the depreciation and impairment losses have been calculated correctly. So this is where you come in as the auditor. Okay. Okay. And then, then they go on to say as part of a broad based black economic empowerment um, uh, living well is planning to expand considerably considerably in the 2022 financial year so they want to expand and the deal will involve a listed company which requires living well to be audited externally for the first time so this is the first time these people will be audited and they want to expand um, they want to expand the company and they are required to have an audit so as Living Well had a public interest score of less than 100, the company was independently, independently reviewed in prior years by an accounting firm who is not registered to perform audits. So these people have never had audits. The only thing that took place was just reviews, right? And then okay. part of the BBE, BBB EE deal, the listed company will buy 80% of the shares. So this is like this is a big deal for the company. Um, there's like you know there's there's a there's a big deal coming up. There's a listed company that wants to buy eighty percent of the shares, and perhaps this will mean more profits for Living Well. And mm -hmm. to the question on, I know the question was not asked, but you know I just want you to think along those lines to say okay, if the, if you get a question that's asking you for potential risk of material misstatement at financial statement level, these people are under pressure mm -hmm. to this deal you understand they are under pressure to secure the yes. so there's a potential there's a you know there's a likelihood that there's a possibility that they may um misstate overstate their yes yes, yes. so that they can and correct. understate their assets yeah their so liabilities can, mm -hmm. so that they can secure this big deal so when you get a question asking for risk of material misstatement at financial statement level um, you think along the mm -hmm. way to say, do these people have any incentive to manipulate the financial statements as a whole? And so, mm. so then you look out for that um, in the information that the, man that the managers will give you. And then they go on to say that the transaction will be finalized by the end of August um, after the audit report um, for the 2021 year has been obtained and all the legal requirements have been met and registered. And then the, the chief financial officer of Living Well is a registered chartered accountant and as a token of appreciation to you and the audit partner on the engagement, the CFO has decided to gift you and the audit partner who is also part of the executive management of the audit team, of the audit firm, um, a Living Well voucher, a, a, level, a Living Well voucher to the value of 5,000 Rand and it can be used at Living Well Warehouse for you and the audit partner's benefit. Okay. So I think be like a specific question on this. Um, yeah, I think there will be a specific question about this gift, but right now, uh, back, I'm just going to go back to the question quickly. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the required and it says describe the substantive procedures um, that you would conduct to obtain audit evidence in respect of the occurrence, assertion for additions and disposals of mini trucks, and the accuracy evaluation and allocation assertion relating to the accumulated depreciation of trucks. So 
um, what do they mean when they say occurrence? What's your understanding of occurrence? Uh, if the additions had occurred. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, so basically, yeah, so basically, My, yeah. Okay. I'm saying when they speak about occurrence, as we're mm. speaking about the addition, so you must verify whether there were any additions that had occurred. Correct. So, yes. Yeah. So you want to establish, um, you want to establish whether there were any additions, whether the additions place, any additions and disposals took place, and they pertain to the company. Okay, because just because there was an addition of a mini truck, it does not necessarily mean that the mini truck belongs to the company. So when we test for occurrence, yes. we want to find out, um, number one, did this addition or disposal actually take place? And number mm -hmm. two, does this addition or occurrence pertain to the company? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and then the second question is asking for accuracy, valuation, and allocation. A lot of people don't have a problem with understanding accuracy, but what is your understanding yeah. of valuation? Uh, valuation. Isn't it speaking about uh, the value of the mini trucks? Yeah, so it's talking about the value. How did these people get to the value of the mini trucks? So that's what we talk about when we say valuation, right? Valuation. Yes. Well, did they get a specialist to do the valuation? Or correct, correct. Did, did they just yeah. wake up and say, "Okay, this is how we are going to um, value our trucks," or did they get an expert to actually um, value the the, um, the 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 trucks, right? So now. Um, um, now that we know that the mini trucks belong in the um, finance and investment cycle, okay, another yes. important thing that I want you to be aware of is that if you go to your textbook right now, which textbook are you using? Auditing notes. You're using auditing notes, right? Yeah. You go yes. to auditing notes right now. You're not going to find substantive procedures on mini trucks, you know, you're not going to find the yes. procedures. And that is because mini trucks fall under PPE. They fall under property plant and investment. Oh, yes. It's, it's Sorry, it's property plant and equipment, not investment. Yeah. And equipment, yes. Yes. So that's where, okay. yeah. So that's where, that's where um, the substantive procedures are. So please, when you find some, just have a look at them and then just practice them, okay? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I'm looking for occurrence. So PPE still falls under finance and investment cycle. Yes, yes. So these are like okay. big assets under PPE. There's like your big assets. There's your motor vehicles. Um, there's your, it's uh, it's motor vehicles. It's land and buildings plant and machinery so if you're dealing with the with the audit of a machinery it would fall under ppe if you're dealing with furniture mm. equipment um it would fall under ppe vehicles land and buildings so all of those things fall under ppe so there's 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 nothing in the textbook um that talks about sus substantive procedures just for a mini v a mini truck or a, a motor vehicle oh, yeah. it's, you know so it's ppe <clears throat> huh? So okay. For occurrence, uh, to test for occurrence, um, very important, right? Um, these people yes. are asking for. Are you are you able to tell me why they're asking for occurrence and not existence of additions and disposals of mini trucks? Can you tell me why they want occurrence and not um existence? I'm not sure. You're not sure. All right. So what are these additions? I want you to think, I want you to picture, um, I want you to picture a ledger. Okay. Yes. And let's say you have an opening balance, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
what kind of assertions would you like would relate to that opening balance? Is it going to be a transaction assertion or an account balance assertion? Are you are you comfortable with the difference between the two types of assertions? No, I'm not. Okay. So there's two types of assertions, right? There's transaction yes. assertions, which are um, assertions relating to transactions. So what is a transaction? Things like sales, things like depreciation, expenses. Why? Because they don't have a balance brought down. And then everything that has a balance brought down is an account. So we, the, the, the assertions that will be that will relate to that account will be account balance assertions. So now occurrence is a transaction assertion and some things like existence are account balance assertions. Are you getting what I'm saying? Or are you lost? No, I, I understand. I'm yes. So now back to the ledger, you've got an opening balance. It's a balance. So the assertion that will, that will be that will relate to that balance will be your existence, um, your rights, and all of that, because those are account balance assertions. And then the movements in between the closing, the opening balance and the closing balance are transactions. And that's why um they are talking about occurrence because it's a transaction assertion. Are you following? Yes. Yes. So that's why mm -hmm. you should understand the difference between the two. They are not asking for ex mm. because existence is for account balance assertions. And this time around, does uh do disposals and additions have balance brought downs? Are they account balances? No, they are just movements in between the opening balance and the opening balance. Oh, okay. It makes sense. So that's why they are not asking for existence because these things don't have a balance brought down. They are not account balances. They are transactions in between opening balance and closing balance. So on the opening balance, then you will perform bal account balance assertions. On the closing balance, you will perform um, account balance assertions as well. Okay, so I just okay. understand the difference between the two, but please go back to your assertions because assertions are, foundation, are the foundation of understanding substantive procedures. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So now we want to establish the occurrence of additions and disposals. So how do we do that? We select a sample of additions from the fixed asset register. If these people own any trucks, surely they should have a fixed asset register. So they must give us the fixed asset register, and then we will select a sample of additions from the fixed asset register and trace it to the capital budget, um, to the capital budget, minutes of directors meetings, um, purchase requisitions and etc. Why do we want the capital budget? Because if these people are saying to us, "Listen, we bought a truck this year, right? How am how am I as the auditor going to prove it? Um, the must this you know this is a big expenditure. It's not something that they wake up today and decide we are buying a truck. This is something that will be discussed mm -hmm. in these meetings. And for me to prove that this purchase took place or this addition of mini trucks took place, I can prove that through the director's meetings when they decided that, okay, um, in 2021, we are going to buy a truck. So that's how I can prove that the disposal or the addition took place, the minutes, right? Um, yes. Can I prove, um, how else can I prove occurrence? I can also inspect the asset itself. Um, I can ask the people, hey, can you guys take me to where you keep your mini trucks? And remember, um, I have a fixed asset register as well. And then I, if they tell me, listen, we bought a truck, um, this is the registration number of the truck, they must take me to where that truck is parked. And then that's how I can um, verify that, okay, this addition did take place. Okay. Yeah. You, you verify occurrence. That's how you 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 verify occurrence and then i can inspect the purchase documentation to confirm that it is made out to the client and for i mean i mean inspect the purchase document the, the, the purchase documentation um whether it's an invoice or a contract and i can use that to confirm that you know these people really purchased um a truck 
So if these people are telling you, listen, um, there's a balance of 3 million in the financial statement and this relates to mini trucks. And by the way, we bought a couple of trucks this year. How do I prove that? I'll ask for the invoice and say, okay, you bought a couple of trucks. Can I have some invoices or some contracts or something um, to prove that you guys really bought these mini trucks? So that's how you test for um, occurrence. Okay. Um, and then um, what else can you do? You can also... Um, for disposals, right? For disposals, um, if they tell you we sold a couple of mini trucks this year, you can inspect the supporting documentation um, to prove, I mean, the documentation that was used to approve the disposal for an authorizing signature. So if you're dealing with such a big company, no one just wakes up one morning and decide, listen, I'm selling the truck. It doesn't work like that. Some manager must mm -hmm. prove the disposal of the truck. So if they tell me that, no, listen, we sold a couple of trucks, they must, they must give me a signature approving the, the, the disposal of that mini truck, okay? Yeah. And yes. Some yeah. will even have a report with a list of all the... Exactly. Disposals. Exactly. Mm. So I need something, but I want you to take note of the, of the, the language that is being used here. Um, we are inspecting, mm. not looking, okay? We are inspecting. Um, putting documentation we are not looking so don't write looking in your in your in your answer you will not get your mark you have to use the correct english the correct jargon um okay yeah and then um another thing if they tell me if if they tell you we made a couple of disposals this year um you trace the proceeds of the sale if you sold mini trucks surely um you guys were paid something for these mini trucks and how can i prove this um i can trace the proceeds of the sale to the bank statement. Um, yeah, so I can be able to track the sale in the bank statement to say, oh, okay, indeed, 100,000 Rand was paid um, during the currency of assessment. And then that's how you, um, or during the current financial year. And then that's how you prove that, okay, indeed, there was a disposal, okay? So that's, um, okay. okay? And, okay. And then the second part is asking for accuracy evaluation and allocation assertion relating to the accumulated depreciation um, of the mini trucks. So if you go through your textbook, there's a whole lot of substantive procedures to talk about here. Um, mm -hmm. I think they will get easier when you do more questions. Um, the more practice you do, they will get easier and easier and easier for you to understand. So what do you do to test accuracy evaluation and allocation? Um, you obtain the, yeah, you obtain um, the original cost or, of the asset disposed um, from the fixed asset register. So you get a sample from the, from the fixed asset register and what do you do? You recalculate the accumulated depreciation. So if they told you that we've been using the straight line um, basis and we've been, um, dividing the cost um, over five years, and then you do exactly that. You recalculate the accumulated mm -hmm. depreciation. Um, yeah, and then for valuation, um, you confirm by inquiry. So, so you you inquire. You don't ask. So you don't say, "I'm going to ask management to say, um, what accounting policy did you use, or was your accounting policy consistent with the years, with the prior years." You don't ask management. You inquire from management to say, okay, um, you guys said you've been using this accounting policy, but has this accounting policy been consistent with the prior years? Have it, has it been consistent? So that's valuation now. Um, are you following? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. And then you obtain a representation letter from management confirming that they have reassessed the useful life and the residual value of the assets um, in accordance to IAS 16, right? So, yeah. So you want to find out, did you guys just wake up and say we're, you're going to divide by five? Or did you guys just wake up and say the residual value is this much? Or did you guys follow the if mm -hmm. That's very important. Because you have to, you know, adhere to the IFRS standards, okay? Um, when okay. inspecting the, 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 the mini trucks, um, 
you inquire about any damage and 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 establish whether such items have i mean such damages have been written down so for example if the, the the question did mention that some of the trucks were damaged because of being overused and all of that right so those damages when when um assets are severely damaged they have like the value has to be corrected you get what i'm saying so if the value was five yes. thousand rand and now this truck is 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 so damaged there's no way you can keep it at 500,000 rand in the books you have to make an adjustment for that um for that damage because otherwise you would be overvaluing this vehicle you'd be overvaluing your assets and you get what i'm saying so you you would be materially misstating the value of your assets um by not taking account those damages so you have to find out from management are you guys um recording these damages are you guys um you know what are you doing about these um damages so there's a whole lot of stuff to talk about when it comes to valuation um by inspection for example um yeah by inspection and a physical inspection yeah, physical, yes, physical, there's physical inspection as well. And there's reperforming the depreciation calculation. We spoke about reperforming depreciation, um, accumulated depreciation. And then you can also do the same for the current year depreciation. And you reperform it and to ensure that accuracy and compliance with the depreciation policy. So you want to make sure, okay, um, is the current year depreciation um accurate and is it you know, in line with the depreciation policy and stuff like that. So there's a whole lot of things to talk about when it comes to valuation. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but please go through them in your textbook and just try practice them and apply them into different types of questions. I think your biggest takeaway here is when they talk about an asset, a big asset, you should be able to know that, okay, they are talking about um, property planned and equipment. And this is in the finance and investment cycle. So you have to know what cycle they're talking about. Your question won't straight out say, hey, um, can you give us substantive procedures for the purchases cycle? Or can you give us substantive procedures for the payroll cycle? What they will do is they'll mm -hmm. just give you a work paper that has salaries and wages and you must know that, okay, the procedures that I'm going to perform here are procedures relating to the payroll cycle. So you have to know your cycles okay so things like loan so basically everything that falls in the in the fine in the statement of financial position except inventory because mm -hmm. the country has its own cycle okay so everything yes. it falls under the finance and investment cycle so if you're dealing with um things like share capital you may be asked to to, to provide um substantive pre audit procedures on share capital or on a loan or, you know, so mm -hmm. other things that you know that, okay, I'm going to, these things, these things fall under the, the um, statement of financial position. So those things you will find in the finance and investment cycle. And then the big assets um, will fall under specifically PPE. So that's your machinery, your, your land and buildings, um, your equipment, um, motor vehicles, and et cetera. So that, that would be PPE. So do you have any questions on this particular question? No, I'm fine. Okay. So um, the second question then says, with reference to background information and inventory, describe the substantive audit procedures to test the rights and accuracy, valuation and allocation assertions of the inventory in transit from the foreign supplier. So that foreign supplier statement is very, important um routing is not about how much you write i keep saying this like it's about how relevant you are okay mm -hmm. so they want right accuracy valuation and allocation of the inventory in transit from the foreign supplier so let's go read more about that So, okay, so they didn't give us much information um, regarding the inventory. Um, sometimes you may get like a work paper 
for example, if you take a look at the payroll information, do you see this information that's here in work, in work paper E1? Do you see that information? Yes. 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 So most of the times you will be given a work paper and then you will have to like just go through the information in the work paper. But this time around for inventory, you're not exactly given a work paper. You're just given like um, some information, right? So let's go through it. Um, so it says that the audit team has attended the inventory count. Very important piece of information. Why is this important? Um, this is important because in inventory, there's three types of counts. There's what we call a cycle count and the substantive procedures relating to a cycle count are different from the substantive procedures that you will provide, I mean, that you will perform during a year end count, okay? So there's three types of counts. There's the cycle count. And basically what a cycle count is, I'll just give an example. The company can decide that, you know what? Um, every three months, we are going to perform an inventory count every three months. So that would be a cycle count or to say every six months, we are going to perform an inventory count, okay? And then there's what we call okay. a year end count, which is um, done only at the end of the year. Okay. okay, so it's only done at the end of the year. And then there's what we call a post inventory count. So this is the count that, I mean, these are proce the substantive procedures of a post inventory count are procedures after the count. Okay, oh, okay. so okay. when you get an inventory question, you mustn't just jump into answering the question. You must ask yourself, are they asking me for information of, of a psych for substantive procedures of a cycle count? Are they asking me for substantive procedures of um, um, a year end count? Or are they asking me for procedures relating to a post inventory count? So when the question mm -hmm. is that the audit team has attended the inventory count, it means that whatever you're going to talk about will be after, will be you know procedures relating to the period after the inventory count you get what i'm saying yes yeah so okay and then they say okay the audit team has attended the inventory count and is satisfied that all the necessary adjustments pertaining to the count have been performed so they are saying okay the count went well and we have adjusted you know so if there was an inventory loss that took place um that you know that came up that that arose during the count that inventory loss was recorded and then we have adjusted the inventory balance, okay? Okay. I'm going to tell you that, however, several large shipments of health products purchased from foreign suppliers um, during February, 2021. So, so we, we, the company purchased a couple of products from foreign suppliers in February, 2021. And these products were not yet cleared at the Durban Harbor. Due to the coronavirus lockdown measures imposed in South Africa, the Durban Harbor had extensive delays in clearing the backlog of imports into South Africa. Okay. So now mm -hmm. you are dealing with a situation here. You're dealing with a situation here where the company has a year end. Can I just verify when the, where, what the year end is? Because that's important information. Um, I'm looking for the financial year and okay. Actually, looks like February. Um, yeah, twenty eight February. Yeah, can you see that twenty eight yes. February twenty twenty one? Do you see that? Yes. Okay. You are dealing with a situation now um, where at year end, these people have purchased a couple of uh, products from some international supplier and these products have not yet arrived um, in South, well, they are in South Africa, but they have not yet been cleared. And that means they are not yet in, you know, in, in our warehouse, okay? So we're dealing with a situation here now where they're saying, listen, we have recorded in the inventory balance, we have included a couple of stuff. Don't worry, 
the items are not yet, they're not yet here in the warehouse, but they are stuck at the Durban Harbor. And then mm -hmm. how do you then prove that as an auditor? How do you prove that? If they tell you that um, we've got stuff that are, are stuck at some harbor and we have included the amount in the, in the, you know, in the inventory account, how do you prove that? So you inquire of management as to whether any inventory is held on consignment um, for other parties. What do we mean when we say on consignment? We mean on behalf of other parties. Because just because you're telling me that um, you've got inventory that you imported, what if some of that inventory belongs to someone else? So management must tell me, they must assure me that no, listen, um, all of the inventory items that are at the harbor belong to us. We have rights over the inventory um, items, okay? So they must, okay. management must tell me that. And then um, secondly, I will obtain a listing of inventory goods in transit and inspect the relevant orders or contracts to determine whether ownership has passed to the client. So if they're telling me that, no, um, we've got stuff, we've got a couple of items that are stuck at the Durban Harbor, there should be some mm -hmm. documentation to prove that these um, health products belong to you. So there must be okay. something, be a contract, give me something, give me a contract that's written, living well, PTY, LTG or whatever, give me something to show that um, these items actually belong to you, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, another example would be when performing the pricing procedures for valuation, um, inspect the invoices to ensure that they are made out to the client. So this is still over, this is still rights, right? This is still testing for rights. Mm -hmm. Just give me a second. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so I was mm -hmm. that um, we are still discussing rights over the inventory um, in transit. Yes. And yeah, so when um, performing the pricing procedures for, for the valuation assertion, we then inspect um, the invoices to ensure that they are made out to the client. So if you guys are saying that you bought a couple of items um, from a foreign supplier, surely there's an invoice. And that invoice must have the name of Living Well. Do you understand? Yes. So that's how I can yes. prove that, okay, indeed, the inventory items that are stuck at the harbor belong to you. It's true Living Well. Yes, yes. So those are just some of the examples. And then what else did the question ask for? Let me just check quickly so we spoke about rights um then there's accuracy evaluation and allocation assertions okay cool yes cool so how do we then test for accuracy um valuation and allocation and the question explicitly said we want you to talk about the imported goods so what do we do we then um for example because okay. if these people i'm just giving an example if these people bought like a thousand products a thousand health products right yes we can't test every single purchase that they made we can only test a, mm. a sample yes so your sample can be literally anything. You can just decide, you know what? I want to um, select a sample of your high value products and say, okay, mm -hmm. if, 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 if you bought products that were worth 100,000, I mean, 100 rand per product, and mm -hmm. these couple of products that, 
that were worth like 1000 can i test those ones so in in this big in this big batch that you have you single out um a sample any sample okay mm -hmm. so i'm giving an example with high value um items and then you obtain the supplier's invoice uh, or shipping contract and you reperform the unit cost calculations so this is for the imported goods. So then you select that yes. sample because you can't test every single thing. And then on that sample, then you just do a unit, you reperform a unit, um, a unit times cost calculation just to make sure that it was calculated correctly. Okay. Okay. I'm checking for price. This is accuracy evaluation and allocation, remember. And then whilst you do that, you verify that the correct exchange rate was used to convert. Um, the foreign currency to rent. So whilst you're doing that, you then convert to, to the for, to the um, to the foreign currency to make sure that these people use the correct currency number one. And you know, because currencies um you know foreign currencies fluctuate all the time, so you have to do that calculation to make sure that they use the correct cal um the correct foreign exchange rate and all of that. Okay, and okay. Also, because these goods were shipped, you also want to, you know, um, make sure that the appropriate import and custom duties and custom, I mean, shipping charges were included. So because all of these things, like the, the shipping charges and all of that, these things will form part of the inventory, of the inventory balance. Mm -hmm. So you want to find out, okay, um, what were the shipping costs? What were the custom duties that were paid and all of that? And they must give you some evidence of the costs that they say that they incurred. So those are just some of the examples of um, procedures that you would perform to test the accuracy of these goods that were stuck at the harbor. So do you have any question there? Uh, uh, just to take you back, to the risk of material misstatement as you speak about the, the rates and the exchange, the exchange rates. So mm -hmm. now I'm thinking if the questions were asking about the risk of material misstatement in financial statement level, yeah. would I be correct to say the management might misstate the financial statement due to errors because the exchange rates might be in, uh, incorrectly allocated. Yeah. Um, yeah, there is a possibility, especially if um, these people are buying large volumes of products internationally. So yes, there would, yes. Be risk, there would be a risk that these people are not using the correct exchange rates. So yeah, that's, okay. there would be, there's a, you know, there's a possibility. So that's just something for you to look out to say, okay, if you guys are buying so much stock internationally, um, are you mm -hmm. using the correct exchange rates? So yes, um, the mm -hmm. possibility of risk of material misstatement in that case. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I see you have an understanding of risk of material misstatement. Yeah, see, I was struggling. Yeah. <laughs> No, keep but practicing. I think I think if you practice these things, you should you should be really really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have? Any I don't know. No, I'm fine. We can proceed. Okay. So we're gonna look at the last question for tonight, and then we're gonna finish the question in the next session. Um. So the last question. Oh, it's the third question. It say it says. With reference to background information, with reference to the background information and inventory, um, for each account balance listed, list the inherent risk factors and explain, um, describe with relevant reasoning why that inherent risk factor is applicable or not applicable to the account balance, and then assess where the account balance belongings belongs on the spectrum of inherent risk. So, okay, so number one they've given you account balances. So they've given you inventories and account balance, not a transaction. Okay. And then they've given okay. you land and equipment. It's also an account balance, all right? And now they want you to talk about, they want you to talk about um, inherent risks, um, risk factors, and they want you to explain them. And then number two, um, they want you to assess, um, the, the, they want you to assess 
the level of the inherent risks. They want you to say, okay, after explaining the inherent risk factors, they want you to say, is this risk um, on a lower level or a middle level or a higher level, you know? So that's what you are required to do, all right? Okay. So what is your understanding of inherent risk factors or inherent risk? Inherent risk isn't it the risk uh, before controls are put in place? Inherent before, can you, can you repeat that? Inherent risk, isn't it the risk before controls are put in place? Mm, the risk before controls are put in place. Well, okay. All right, let me explain it this way. So, mm -hmm. um, risk of, okay, so now you understand what risk of material misstatement is, right? Um, yes. So now, risk of material misstatement is made up of two things. And number one, it's inherent mm -hmm. risk. And number two, control risk, right? So, yes. yeah. so these two things are the things that make risk of material misstatement go high or go down, mm -hmm. okay? So what is inherent risk? Inherent risk is a built-in risk. So these are built-in risk factors that um, they're just built in, perhaps according to the nature of the company. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, what example can I give? If you're dealing with a company, that has say 500 stores, right? Say there are yes, 500 yes. shops or 500, um, yeah. So this company has like 500 shops worldwide, worldwide, and then they have a head office, and the head office is, is the one that's responsible for buying and uh, for buying goods and then delivering them to the to the shops to the 500 shops, right? So then the mm -hmm. risk in this company would be that. Um, the shops are too many to account for everything. Do you understand? They are too many yes. to account for every single sale or every single purchase. So things like theft can easily take place and no one would even notice because the shops are just too many. You see? Mm -hmm. So that's, yes. that's, a, that's a built in risk of the company. It's built in risk. And so when this built in risk is, hi is high, then risk of material misstatement will go high as well because risk of material misstatement is made up of the inherent risk and the control risk. The control risk now is the risk that um, the controls are not functioning. The, the controls in the, in the environment are not functioning. So when there's poor controls in the environment, what does that mean? It means that the higher the control risk, then um, the higher the risk of material misstatement as well. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. So now back to controls. Let me give you a typical example of controls. If you go to Edgar's um, or you go to some other shop and you try to open an account, um, what will they ask you for? They'll ask you for your, your ID, right? Your ID, so, your residence. Exactly. So those are the, the that's mm -hmm. a control that's put in place in that shop to make sure that they give credit to people who can actually pay the credit. Okay, mm -hmm. the control. So now when you find yourself, when you find yourself dealing with a client whereby they offer credit, but there are no background checks done, everyone can just go there and just take stuff on credit. So there are poor controls in that company. Mm -hmm. So a poor controls, it means that um, you know, risk of material, there's a high level of risk of material misstatement. Okay. So risk of material misstatement has to do with the inherent factors as well as the controls. So, but this time around, the question wants you to talk about the inherent um, risk factors, the built-in factors, the, you know, the factors that are built in. So you would have to, you know, um, think of the factors that are built in. Um, the, you know, there are so many that you can talk about. And then the second thing, then you'd have to assess the level of the inherent risk. So some of the examples, when it comes to inventory, some of the examples um, of the inherent risk factors, uh, that, um, you know, if you guys are dealing with, um, if you guys are dealing with um, imported goods, there's a risk that, you know, that the company can just tell you, you know what, things were stolen on the ship 
and then what you know so it's a built-in risk um they can tell you inventory items were just stolen on the ship or inventory items got damaged on the way to to to, to the warehouse or they got damaged at the harbor or they just went missing or you know so that's an example of an inherent risk and then now um, you then have to assess um, the level of inherent risk to say, okay, when it comes to the imports, there's a really high inherent risk of um, inventory being damaged um, on the way because this inventory is coming from far. It could be coming from China or wherever. So it's coming from far. There's, there's, so there's a high risk that this inventory can get to our warehouse damaged or in, in, in quality or not in the condition that we want it to be. So those are just some of the examples. And then when it comes to property plant and equipment, um, yes. the risk that things like the depreciation was not calculated accurately, um, there's a risk that some disposals, you know, the company can just sell something, say they sell a mini truck, right? And then they don't record it in the, in the, um, financial position um, we have we have we have um disposed a mini truck so that's an example mm -hmm. of an inherent risk factor um things like disposals not being recorded or you know yeah so those are just some of the examples i think you can just think about them um the biggest thing here would be that you then must be able to substantiate why you think that thing is an inherent risk factor and then on the third column you are asked to then um assess whether this this inherent risk is high or middle or low and i think yeah that's just about it here do you have any question yes i have a question i just wanted to for you to remind me uh, these things that are called there is the complexity of something like mm -hmm. when when you buy goods from mm -hmm abroad hmm. remember there's exchange rates there's uh, international laws and what's one and whatsoever so the reason i wanted us to discuss this question they did not just answer it um, as you are explaining it to say these are inherent inherent risk is built in risk then you just answer it so they included well of um, complexity there is subjectivity mm -hmm. so um, i i want um, to understand you are talking about oh those... uh, okay i i understand what you're talking about you're talking about inherent limitations right yes okay so let me explain it to you right so that's a good question i think you have to go back to them and read them and just have an understanding of them so basically yes. this is what happens uh, when you're an auditor you can't give mm -hmm. percent assurance to, to, to your client to say, um, listen, I assure you the financial statements are 100% free of material misstatement or error or whatever. You can't do that, okay? You can only give yeah. what you call reasonable assurance. So you can't give absolute assurance. Absolute assurance would be you saying, you know what, I'm 100% sure that these financial statements are correct and all of that. You can't do that. And the reason no, you no. can't do that because of the inherent limitations. So that's what you're talking about. You're talking about inherent limitations. So those are the things that limit you as the auditor to, you know, to give 100% assurance that, um, mm -hmm. that the financial statements are free from material misstatement or error. You can't give 100% mm -hmm. assurance. You can only give what we call reasonable assurance. So yeah, that's what you're talking about. And then um, the inherent limitations would be, for example, yeah, the complexity of, um yeah the complexity of i forgot i forgot them but yeah there's a list in your textbook the complexity of the accounting um treatment yeah so because of the complexity of 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 the cycles and the accounting and everything you know you can't 100% say yes i'm 100% sure that um the financial the financial statements are free from material misstatement. And um, another thing is mm -hmm. an inherent limitation is that you are not there during the year with your client. You are not there at the, at, at the client's company Monday to Friday, ensuring that 
um, you know, the transactions took place, um, everything that they are saying to you is true. You are not with them during the year. You as the auditor only come there like once a year or something. So you can't guarantee everything that the managers tell you. So that's an inherent limitation. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yes. So there's a whole list of them. Um, just please check them out in your textbook. Um, but yes, that, that was a very good question. And thank you for that question. Do you have any other question? No, oh, the reason I wanted us to do that, I wanted to understand how do you link them, like mm -hmm. the inherent limitation to this question. Okay, the inherent limitations have to do with um, the conclusion that you give as the auditor. Remember, the reason you are performing substantive procedures is because you want to form a conclusion. You are an auditor and you want to come to a conclusion mm -hmm. on whether um, the financial statements are free from material misstatement and you know whether the information that the managers have given you is a true reflection of the company. So that's why you are performing substantive procedures to come to a conclusion. So now your inherent mm. limitations have a relationship with the conclusion that you will give. So they are basically limitations mm. that will limit you from giving a, an absolute uh, for, from giving absolute assurance, um, which is you saying that I'm 100% sure that um, these financial statements are good. You can't do that as the auditor. And the reason you can't do that is because of the inherent limitations. So do you understand where they fit into the picture? Yes, yes. Okay. Because my, my, my confusion was when the question came, it was like list and explain uh, inherent risk factors. Oh, okay. So this one, it was not really. Yes, they are also in. Yeah, I see where you're going with this. So yeah, you, you can also talk about them. That's a very good one. You can also link them and use them for this question, but then you'd have to make them relevant to the account balance that you're talking about. Do you understand what I'm saying? You'd have to make them yeah, the explanation yeah. that you, when they say list and explain the explanation has to be relevant to the background information that they provided us with yes it has to be relevant to the background information because if it's not relevant then you know it it, it won't make sense it has to be relevant to the background information that they've given you um okay mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah, I think with practice, uh, they will. It will make more sense. Yeah. So please, um, mm. do because we don't have much time. Um, your exam is like in a few weeks, so we don't have much. Time. Please practice these questions as much as possible. Um, feel free to send your attempts to me during the week, and I'll have a look at mm. I'll look at them and then give you feedback. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So is there um, anything else? No, thank you. All right, right. Have a lovely evening. Okay, thank you, Susie. Okay, bye.